last event at Hoax 21. I'm proud to, proud to introduce Dorothy Tang. Uh, Dorothy Tang is an assistant professor in landscape architecture at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, she's also the program director of the undergraduate program there. Uh, her research efforts include the investigation of gold mining in Johannesburg, South Africa, the impact of industrialization and, the, and ecological impacts, and the Pearl River Delta in China, and also the landscape, landscape systems and open networks in Shanghai. Her recent efforts include uh, efforts in ecotourism into a reservoir in northern Sichuan province in China. Uh, please uh, wel uh, welcome Dorothy Tang. Does the microphone work? Excellent. Well, thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I was just telling Matthew yesterday when I was picked up from the airport that I haven't been in this country for like two years. So it's kind of strange to be here, and uh, especially Eugene. It's very different than Hong Kong. Um, and the, the reason is because this is what I look at every day. Um, this is uh, a shot from um, the university's East Gate. And what I like about it is this, it's, it's not, you know, photogenic. It's the backside of the university, but that's all the infrastructure that supports the University of Hong Kong, including its water, its drainage system, all the pipes of fresh water, wastewater. I don't even know what other types of pipes. Um, but this is the reality that, that I live in. And so the, the reason I'm here today is to maybe share a little bit about what I have learned about Asia. Um, I've only been in, back in Asia for about five years and still learning about it, um, and how we as designers um, would intervene in, in Asia um, and the unique conditions um, that we are confronted with um, on an everyday basis. So um, I also wanted to congratulate um, you, uh, the conference organizers, for um, this wonderful opportunity to share about what we are doing in Hong Kong. Um, and I thought the theme was especially um, appropriate. Um, the idea that as a catalyst, who is the catalyst? What is the catalyst? It really begins to question the role of designers and the role of design, um, the role of the built environment, and what is um, our, our real engagement with the wor world. So um, my talk this evening um, is, is very personal. It's, it's my work. Um, my explorations with students. Uh, teaching is a very, very big part of what I do. Um, and it is also um, an exploration in what I can do in this world. And I'm not necessarily interested in saving the world. I mean, there's this myth that as designers and architects, we could make a difference in stuff. That um, by planning and designing the environment, you know, one building at a time, um, eventually climate change would go away or whatever. Um, I, while that is a useful kind of ambition, um, I think that the, the role of designers really is in how we engage the world. And the, the, there's a difference between saving the world and engaging the world. And we can have a discussion about this later. Um, but that's the sort of attitude I'm going to take. I'm going to start with a, a series of contract, contrasting images um, a la HSBC. I don't know if you've seen those. Um, engineered and ecologies. On the right-hand side, um, it's very regular ponds. Um, those are shrimp ponds, um, and they're highly engineered. They deal with tidal fluctuation in a very particular way. On the left is a, a sort of naturalistic landscape. Um, it's Brooklyn Bridge Park. It's a, it's a stormwater wetland, and it looks very natural. On the other hand, you could argue that because Brooklyn Bridge Park is a park, and we can talk a little bit more about what goes um, into it, it's actually highly engineered. Um, did you know that, for example, Central Park, as naturalistic as it looks, used to be a swamp, and now it's dry ground. Um, there was tons of um, earth movement that went into it. And so most of the parks, as naturalistic as, we, as they seem, are actually highly constructed. On the other hand, these shrimp ponds on the left, Maipo Marshes, is one of the most important natural conservation areas in Hong Kong. Um, and is, uh, it's a Ramsar site, and it's protected and um, managed by the World Wildlife Fund. And why is that? So at Maipo, um, what, what happened in the 50s was uh, migrants from northern China moved down to Hong Kong, and they actually set up this traditional way of sh far um, shrimp farming. It is um, 
very low tech. It's just a sluice gate. It works with tidal fluctuation. Um, in, in certain times of the year, they let baby shrimp come in, they cultivate them, and then they drain the, fish, uh, the shrimp ponds. And what's interesting about this cycle of um, you know, cultivating shrimp, draining the shrimp ponds, and et cetera, is that during the winter when they drain the shrimp ponds, um, the, the water is low, the shrimp is gone, but then all of the invertebrates and other types of things that you know, live at the bottom of the mudflat actually are exposed. And that coincides with um, the migratory uh, birds that are coming down from, Ala uh, not Alaska, wrong continent, um, Siberia, um, all the way to Australia, and they stop by Hong Kong. And this is one of the most important stops for migratory bird species, including many rare and endangered species like this gray-faced spoonbill. Um, and so they come in the winter. And what's interesting is that shrimp farming in Hong Kong is no longer profitable. So the government actually subsidized shrimp farmers to continue farming shrimp the way that they have been for the past 60 years in order to feed the birds. Um, so there, there's sort of an irony in there in terms of its ecological value, yet at the same time, it really isn't a sustainable practice anymore because economically, it doesn't make any more sense. However, the value of these tidal shrimp ponds are even higher than a traditional mudflat precisely because of these um, maintenance and operation procedures. All right, so today, in my talk, um, I kind of want to play around with this idea of what is ecological, what is not, what is engineered, and what is the role of human beings within this environment. These modified, highly controlled landscapes sometimes could actually be beneficial for endangered species. Um, for Brooklyn Bridge Park, this is a stormwater wetland, um, and I'm just going to I think I've made my point, but um, this naturally, naturalistic looking landscape actually is the result of very, very um, difficult uh, stormwater management regimes, vegetated swales, storage tanks that fell through. Um, a lot of technology actually went into the construction of this wetland. So why Asia? Um, you can see from this map that that uh, the circles represent uh, urban populations, that Asia has some of the f fastest growing and largest cities in the world. I'm going to focus specifically um, in Southeast Asia and East Asia, China, really. Um, and I want to look at infrastructures um, that do several things. They structure cities, um, they redistribute resources, fuel economies, access the rural and cross borders. Um, Depending on the time, I might not get to all of it, and so we can discuss that later on as well. Um, all right, let's move on. So infrastructures that structure is cities. I'm not from Hong Kong, and so when I moved to Hong Kong, I put a grant together to study Hong Kong. I, I felt like I needed to know a little bit more about it. Now, what's interesting about Hong Kong um, is that the topography is very, very steep. Everything in this map, that you see, uh, in this uh, aerial, that you see that's flat is reclaimed land. Um, and you can see that the tallest buildings are mostly um, on the sort of reclaimed land. How many of you, just to get a sense, how many of you have been to Hong Kong? Okay, a few people. Um, and how many of you that went to Hong Kong actually went on the tram line? Okay, not as many. The tram line actually marks the original, um, uh, the original shoreline, and it's about three or four blocks, not, not small blocks, like big blocks, um, inland from where the shoreline is right now. I remember growing up visiting Hong Kong and having dim sum at City Hall right next to the water, and now that water is no longer there. You can not even see the shoreline from that building. So in, in a very, very short amount of time, Hong Kong had to expand. It's a land-based economy. The government controls the land. Um, and uh, the, the majority of capital gain is actually from land acquisitions. Um, for those of you that have been to Hong Kong, you, we are also built on the most geotechnically unstable part of Hong Kong in the hill. So. Um, land reclamation began in the 1890s uh, because when the British came to Hong Kong, 
they decided to occupy the most defensible landscape, which is the northern part of Hong Kong. It's also the narrowest area in terms of um, areas suitable for op occupation. And so for this sort of military strategy, they began to build cities, but then they realized actually Hong Kong was much better as a trade port. So they expanded the land over the years. Um, it, it's grown a lot. What I want to point out here, uh, maybe I can do that here, is that um, this red stuff, this is the current airport, um, which is entirely reclaimed. And the old airport is over here. And so there's these famous photos, um, also reclaimed land, of uh, landing in Hong Kong right in the middle of skyscrapers. Um, now, this airport is important because it, w it opened in 1998. It was part of the effort um, to expand Hong Kong's capacity as a commercial center. Um, and the, the urban airport was clearly um, not up to task. So they scouted out a new piece of land, or island, um, decided to reclaim all that land. And part of that project was to create um, transportation infrastructure um, in order to service that airport. That airport um, in Lantau Island over here is a 24-minute train ride to Central, which is a central business district. Um, and, all, and along that rail line, you can see in the pink that that was the area that were reclaimed. Um, this was also reclaimed as part of it, and that's Disneyland. So the, it's, um, it, it's an interesting development model, uh, precisely because there is actually a lot of urban development that's associated with the airport. It's not just, oh, let's expand the airport and, and reclaim a lot of land. It's, can we use this airport actually to start developing new urban nodes um, along it? And so I'll talk a little bit about it later, but um, over here there's a new town that was built um, in relationship to the airport. And along here, each of these train stations is associated with a new development. Um, let's see what's next. Um, the MTR, the Metropolitan Transport, okay, I don't even know what it means anymore, rail or something like that, MTR, um, is a private corporation. Um, it is the most profitable um, public transportation system in the world. Um, it, it, it makes money instead of loses money. I mean, I lived in New York for a few years, and every time the MTA said that they lost money, tax money is went into it. But here it's completely privately owned and privately operated. Um, and the reason for that is because they actually are property developers over rail operators. Um, my, my boss, Matthew, um, some of you know him, likes to joke that the MTR essentially, you know, plays with trains as if they were toys and um, uh, their, their real occupation is to find uh, empty and vacant land in Hong Kong and plunk large developments there. Um, so this is one example of how that works. This is Kowloon Station, which I'll again talk a little bit more later. Um, it is at the, it's one of the stops on the airport express train. It is um, tied into the Tong Chong line, which is one of the MTR stations. Um, and what's interesting is that at the bottom part, it's uh, sort of the, the basement part, subsurface part, is owned by the MTR. They operate it, it's you know, public, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then they run a, a level, one level of malls right above the train station. And so it's low end um, retail, like a 7 Eleven, um, and you know, some of the banks have ATMs there and all that kind of stuff. And so they make a profit from that. But what they really, really profit from is the luxury mall called Elements over there. It, um, Hong Kong has some of the largest luxury retailers in the world, it has the highest density of them at least. And that mall, um, it's called Elements because it's the five elements. It's circular. You get really lost in there. Um, that the, uh, the MTR basically leases development rights to a private developer, makes a ton of money off of that. And that also within this complex, you can see on the top, the tallest building is the ICC Tower. It is the tallest building in Hong Kong. Um, Credit Suisse and all the banks are located in there. All the towers around it are residential. And so this is sort of uh, every urban designer's dream. 
You know, like every urban design school in the world, it, it thinks about transit-oriented development and, and starts to think about these complex megastructures that actually accommodates all of this. And it all happens in Hong Kong. It might not look pretty, but it does happen. And that's how the MTR makes money. So essentially, the property that they develop um, funds all the capital costs of expanding the railroad. And the users are only charged for um, the, the sort of operational costs. And that's how um, they are profitable. Now, this model, um, MTR now actually consults for many, many cities in China. Um, they export their knowledge. Um, they're supposed to be the best of the best. Um, and what's interesting is that because the MTR is privately funded, so there's a different incentive in terms of making a profit versus these other cities that have publicly funded transportation systems, they don't have the same kind of incentives or power as this large corporation. So again, the question of whether Hong Kong's transportation is a sustainable model or not um, is up um, for questions. So this project that I worked on, uh, we looked at the eight stations along the MTR station, uh, and along the Tong Chong, this new MTR line. Um, we ran a research seminar for graduate students trying to use different ways of representing these eight neighborhoods and the kind of development occurred along them. Um, and I'm going to show a short video that sort of summarizes the issues that we were interested in. So that's the Disneyland has their own train. Um, Through this forum, we began to explore the different resources that Hong Kong actually needs in order to sustain itself. 90% of our food, for example, is imported from China. Um, and issues of urban renewal, transportation. Issues of heritage um, and land reclamation. Um, and we produced a booklet, um, and it's all available on our website. It's uh, hongkongplatforms.org. Um, and and they're, they're, uh, the material there for high school students, I'm sure you're more advanced than that, um, begins to question these types of infrastructures that are part of our daily life. So for example, for Kowloon Station, we looked at what is a transit-oriented development, um, what kind of um, time-space compression is there, and is there uh, social justice in all of that? So for example, there is a new um, uh, high-speed rail station that's going to link Hong Kong with Beijing in 10 hours. And so people in Shenzhen, when this thing is completed, can get to Hong Kong within 15 minutes. But it takes the nearest neighborhood uh, someone from the nearest neighborhood to walk here, it takes about half an hour to walk there, right? So there's a, there's a difference in how people begin to access the site um, and to begin to interact with it. And so we began to look at how these types of infrastructure began to interact with the landscape, um, how people interacted with it, and the impact um, on the local culture. And so, um, again, I'm going to show a, a few more videos that our students produced that also try to address this. So the Vic Victoria Harbor is one of the most important um, landscapes in Hong Kong. And the, the width of it actually has narrowed significantly over the years. Um, and what people don't realize is that all of the land that we stand on is actually reclaimed. Um, and so this, this group of students really try to question how architectural heritage actually began to relate to reclamation practices. Um, in Hong Kong. And so all of these videos are actually meant to be more like teasers, um, so you would go on our website and actually find out more. Like I mentioned, 90% of food in Hong Kong um, comes from China. Um, it's all imported. There is a very, very particular kind of system. What's interesting about the food, too, is that um, uh, large supermarket conglomerates actually lease land in China to make sure that you know, food is safe, um, they commission people to, to farm on their behalf. Um, and there's this open secret that food going to Hong Kong is a much higher quality and is safer than food in China. So there's actually fake Hong Kong groceries in China at the moment. Um, and so this group of students really try to understand 
um, where food comes from, what are the issues that are related to it ecologically as well as socially and economically. The last video that I'm showing, um, this is the construction that is happening along the Hong Kong airport at the moment. There's a new bridge that is going to link Hong Kong to Macau, which is across the way from um, uh, across the, the estuary. Um, and what's happening with the reclamation, with the pile driving, um, there's even talks of a third runway for the Hong Kong airport. Um, it's really endangering the shoreline species on, along a very, very thin um, strip of land just north of this island. And so students here were asking um, questions about this infrastructure and how it begins to relate to the ecological systems. Um, as part of this exercise, students actually had to go to these neighborhoods and construct a 30-minute um, walking tour. Um, it, and if you're ever in Hong Kong, you can download the walking tour. Um, the, the tour is an, um, narrated by the students. We actually um, ha asked uh, high school students um, to test the audio tours to make sure that they were legible. Um, and so you can see the Mickey Mouse train again. Um, and we have a website um, that's supposed to encourage, you know, the Facebook generation, but some, somehow it's not quite working. We developed a mobile phone app as a way, again, to communicate these ideas about sustainability in Hong Kong. Um, and we had an exhibition actually just about a year ago um, in the Central Market Escalators, which has a daily volume of 70,000 people passing through every day, also to communicate some of these ideas. Um, and so here are some of the exhibition images over here. It was really funny to watch kids watch the videos because they thought they were touch screen um, and things didn't actually quite work. Some of you have seen this, for those of you that have been to Hong Kong. Counterpart Cities is another exhibition that I worked on for the Shenzhen Biennale in 2011. It was modeled after rising currents um, and I worked with Jonathan Solomon on this. It's a very simple concept. Hong Kong and Shenzhen are only divided by a border. Um, and so we were interested in finding out what the environmental relationships were between the two cities. Just to give you a scale comparison, um, Hong Kong and Shenzhen are on the left, New Jersey and New York City are on the right. Um, I just looked it up today. The New York metropolitan area is about 20 million people. Um, Hong Kong and Shenzhen combined is 22 million people. Now this, just to give you a sense of scale, these are to scale, um, the, the pink and the, the dark lines are actually transportation systems. And this gives you a sense of how dense Hong Kong and Shenzhen are. So if you can begin to imagine, you know, in the same kind of land mass or even larger, uh, the, the majority of the people actually live in these very compressed spaces, you can have a sense of how dense Hong Kong and Shenzhen are. Um, again, just to give you a sense of it, Hong Kong, only 80%, oh, sorry, only 20% of the land in Hong Kong is occupied because everything else is too steep. Um, and that's why we have to build like crazy. Um, so we started to look at these political boundaries. And this is a map from um, 1866 um, where Hong Kong was just a, a tiny little bit. Um, this, this was the colony. And then this was actually part of Shenzhen, or at that time it was called Bao'an County. Um, and so this political boundary, a very um, artificial political boundary, started to change um, over the years. Um, and we really wanted to break down those political boundaries because although Hong Kong is now part of China, at the same time we still maintain an international border. And so one way of really starting to think about this space is to actually take away everything and start looking at that water and land continuum because water doesn't really respect political boundaries. So we tried to look into what happens with climate change. We you know, went to IPCC, we looked at all the different assumptions, um, and we started looking into other factors that would begin to impact water resources in the two cities. Um, and this is, a, this is a, a journal paper. I don't even remember what um, the title is. But the, the author here um, was arguing that actually the kind of hydrological changes that are happening now within the past 20 years has such a high impact that climate change is like child's play. Um, and I'll try to explain why um, he makes uh, that claim. Um, and so we started mapping the Pearl River Delta, um, just to give you a sense. Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou is up there. I think, Vincent, you're from Guangzhou, right? Um, and so this map shows the sort of uh, 
horizontal um, shift in the land. The, the brown are areas that are reclaimed over the past 30 years. Um, and the, the darkness, um, the gray dots, actually uh, represent inundation um, in the event of uh, six meters of inundation, um, uh, which is a pretty high storm surge in 2050. Um, and we asked designers to start to imagine how we would begin to restructure this urban region based on these um, climate change assumptions. So we looked at that. Then we looked at the vertical change of water um, within the Pearl River Delta. And so what you see is actually excavation um, in the dark brown. And then you also see we've mapped um, proposed levees that were, would be built um, on the western part of the delta and how these infrastructures would actually begin to respond to climate change. Now, I want to draw your attention to um, this part. Oops, over here. Um, this is the East River. Um, it is the water source for Hong Kong. And notice that it actually has been, ex the, the water, uh, the bottom of the river has actually dropped about 10 meters over the past 20 years. Um, and so what's really interesting is that the, the water level of that particular river has lowered significantly um, due to the sand excavation. And that sand was illegally shipped to Hong Kong for land reclamation. It's kind of ironic. So we, we identified three issues. We identified um, issues of water resources um, in Hong Kong. 80% of the water in Hong Kong comes from China. Um, we looked at the sort of water, uh, the, the different aqueducts um, and how water came to Hong Kong and provided water to Shenzhen. Um, and so, you know, uh, remember that, that um, the, the East River that has been excavated, it's 10 meters below what it used to be. That is the primary water source for Hong Kong and Shenzhen. And so what happened after the water levels have lowered is that because of this tidal estuary, the water from um, the ocean is actually migrating inland. Um, so there's backwash going upstream um, from the mouth of the river because of the lowered elevation of that water. Uh, uh, of the, the bottom of the river. And so what's happened is that um, you can see here we've mapped where all the industrial pollution is. This is Dongguan, which is one of the largest textile manufacturing zones um, in China. Uh, your, all your genes are manufactured there. And you can begin to imagine the kind of water pollution um, that's associated with that. Because now water is actually moving upstream, all that pollution is also migrating in that same direction. And so you see how everything is starting to tie together. In addition, Shenzhen has decided that they want a different water source. And so they have decided to create a new aqueduct further upstream on the same river um, to provide water for about 16, 17 million people. Um, and so Hong Kong now has to negotiate with Shenzhen to make sure that their water source is protected due to the migration of uh, all this pollution and the, the threat that Shenzhen now will have the cleaner water um, and more backwash would actually happen. Coupled with 20 to 30 centimeters of sea level rise, you can begin to imagine that in, in about 30 years, you don't want to live in Hong Kong at all. There's no water available to Hong Kong, um, and that becomes a big issue. So we, we started looking into these types of threads. I'm not going to go into detail about what's happening here. Um, we looked into transportation infrastructure. Hong Kong is a big port, um, and the kind of port networks that are related to Hong Kong and Shenzhen and their competition. We looked into um, the shared bay, um, the, the literal border between Hong Kong and Shenzhen and the sort of ecological systems that are associated with it. Um, my Po, the wetland area that I was talking about earlier, is over here. Um, and it's a very, very important part of the sort of health um, in, in that part of Hong Kong and Shenzhen. We invited six designer teams. Um, and over six weeks, we asked them to generate new visions for Hong Kong and Shenzhen based on those three themes. Um, Three of the teams were from Hong Kong, and three of the teams were in, in Shenzhen. And uh, we actually managed to get Arab to, to help us um, with um, figuring, figuring this out. The teams are supposed to collaborate to a certain point. Um, they address the issues of research that we had mentioned earlier. And this was exhibited. About 120,000 people um, were able to see this in Shenzhen. Um, we had a website, unfortunately it's gone down. Um, again, these are some of the projects that they generated. I'm just gonna talk about one project 
um, by Stefan Al, who now is at University of Pennsylvania, um, his team actually began to look at freshwater networks and created a sort of smart grid of water um, for wastewater as well as freshwater. And so the idea is that you would actually clean wastewater to a certain extent. You can't clean it completely, right? But perhaps, you know, um, or, uh, sewage water that has high organic content that could be used very well for certain kinds of uses. Um, but Hong Kong generates a lot of sewage, but um, there's no place in Hong Kong to use that high nutrient water. So maybe that could be shipped to other parts of the Delta where there's still um, agriculture production. And so this smart grid um, actually takes advantage of roof spaces, facades. Um, it, it calls for a new architectural form um, and piggybacks on existing infrastructure um, across the entire region um, in order to transport it. Um, and so these are just some of the ideas. Um, it's pretty impressive that they came up with this in six weeks um, with full-time jobs. Um, but these are the kind of visions that um, these designers came up with. So again, I'm not going to go into detail, um, but the intent of this exhibition, um, there were two things. One was, what happens when you place these crazy architectural visions in front of the general public? We did present this again in, in Hong Kong um, and in Shenzhen. And, over 200,000 people saw it. Um, and during the opening, we were asked questions by the general public like, is this really what's going to happen? Um, is this what the government wants? Um, the, and that's when I realized, really, the way that we as designers engage the public is problematic because we have these crazy ideas that might actually work. But yet, the legibility to the general public is very different. So then what is our role if, if we can't adequately um, communicate with the public? How can they get on board to our visions um, when they actually don't understand and are fearful um, of some of the implications? So, um, so that was Counterpart Cities. Um, this is a, a studio class that I've been, I ran for two years. Um, last year, we didn't get to go on a field trip because of the riots in Bangkok. But we were looking at Thailand's water economies. Um, it really started in 2011 with this giant flood. So this, uh, this is the Honda factory north of Bangkok. Um, and those are all brand new Honda. I don't know, maybe they're Civics, whatever you drive, right? Um, and all of them were inundated. In 2011, um, areas north of Bangkok uh, experienced about three months of inundation. And it wasn't from one particular storm. It really was a, a number of different factors. Um, the rainy season started early. Um, uh, there were infrastructure failures. But this is what it looks like um, at the height of the 2011 floods. So Bangkok is over here. Um, this is the Chao Priya River, and over here is the confluence of four different rivers. I'll talk about that more later. Um, this is the rice growing region of uh, Thailand. You know, it's the, the rice, uh, the rice bowl. Um, and notice how Bangkok is not flooded. That was very controversial because they decided to flood everywhere else around it and diverted the flood waters to the two sides rather than flooding Bangkok for political reasons. And so this flood became a hugely political tool. Um, and you began to see how it began to uh, affect communities. And even in the aftermath, which I'll talk about more later, um, it was hugely controversial. Um, so I've always used studios as a way to explore my personal fantasies. Um, so I've always wanted to travel along a watershed from the headwaters all the way to the, the bay. And this is when I got to do it. I picked this watershed because it was safely contained in one country. Um, I didn't have to go across borders. Um, and it was a civilized country. So um, I took students to, uh, to the Jiao Priya. We flew into Chiang Mai and drove down. It's about a 10-hour drive. We drove for about five days and ended up in Bangkok. Um, and during this process, we were really trying to understand the impact of that flood um, along the river. And so before we went, students started doing a bit of research. And this is where um, some of that political, economic um, co uh, contradictions and conflicts begin to come into place. So right now, Thailand, uh, let me see if I have the statistics. Um, Thailand's uh, GDP, about 40%, is it 40? Yes, 40% of it is industrial exporting exports. So um, if you check out your hard drives, you know, Western Digital, um, 
whatever you use. Uh, I'm not trying to advertise for them. Um, they are all, all their factories are actually located here. Um, the can your digital cameras, Canon, um, they're all assembled and man manufactured in Thailand, not, not China like most people think. Um, and so during the floods, the largest loss was actually these export um, um, industrial production, uh, these products, as well as the Honda factory. Um, and since it was 40% of Thailand's GDP, um, another 30% of it is services and tourism, um, the Thai government decided that it was very, very important to safeguard the industrial production. So this is the proposed levee map um, along the Jiao Priya. Um, notice these islands in the middle of the plain. These ones over here and that one over there. Those are the industrial estates where your hard drives and digital cameras are produced. Um, and basically those flood walls are approximately two meters higher than any of the other flood walls um, in the surrounding areas. Um, and so they, they literally built these forts to fortify um, the production of their, their largest export goods. Um, the government spent about 50% of their flood recovery efforts on these small islands. Um, and then the rest of the country got everything else. So my students were outraged. I don't know how you feel about that. But they, they were really, really angry um, that you know, the rest of the world um, didn't get any benefits from the government. Um, this is what it looked like when we visited in 2012. Um, this is the levee you can see. The original ground is over here. Um, this is an earthen levee. Um, there were other flood walls in areas that had less space. Um, they were starting to excavate and build uh, pumping stations. So in the event of flood, what happens when you have a flood wall is, you know, there's water that pools inside. And so you need a, a pumping station to pump the water outside. Otherwise, it's like a, it's like a bathtub, right? So, um, so uh, there were issues of the pumping station where the water went. Um, and this is my favorite photo because you can see the flood wall that's constructed at the edge. In the interior, facing where we are right now, is the industrial estate. And then outside of it is where all the workers live. Um, and so the, again, there is this strange moment where you know, you're literally right next to each other. Some people are flooded, and other vacant areas um, are protected. So students tackled um, the issue of floods um, along the Jiao Priya. Um, looking specifically at these industrial estates. And I'm only going to talk about one student project that I thought was very clever. Um, she, uh, Tamsin, noticed that there were two layers of flood walls. So the original flood wall broke. Um, and so she found out from the management that they actually had like an offset. There's a six meter gap between the old flood wall and the new flood wall. And she was very concerned about the water that was pumped from the um, industrial estates during flood. Because you can begin to imagine um, water comes, rainwater comes down, it hits the ground, there's all of these uh, um, contaminants on the ground, it gets dissolved. Um, and in order to not flood the interior, you have to pump them somewhere else. So she actually created this six meter band around, but in between these flood walls. So she actually advocated for the industrial estates not to um, demolish the interior flood wall and use this as a way to hold some of this flood water and treat it before it was dis discharged into the surrounding um, agricultural areas. And she began to imagine what would happen if all of the industrial estates began to do that and improve their relationship, which was very, very touchy, with its surroundings. Um, another student looked at rice production in this very same plain. So Bank, uh, Thailand is the largest rice exporter in the world. Um, and in 2011, again, um, there was this crazy rice subsidy scheme. So there was a new prime minister, and she decided to buy all the rice from farmers at 40% above market rate. And the idea was to stockpile all this rice and that she, because she thought Thailand controls the rice market. And so once you stockpile it, the market prices go up, and then you can sell it at a larger profit. So that was the scheme. What she didn't realize was that Vietnam and Cambodia and all these other countries were like, ha, 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 you're stockpiling your rice. Well, we're going to produce more rice. And so basically what happened was that particular policy flipped the entire rice market around the world. Um, and so Vietnam, Myanmar, and Cambodia are now taking that place. And so now she's left with a lot of rotting rice um, and no uh, buyers. 
In addition to that, there was a lot of corruption involved, uh, specifically with the middleman. And so this student, um, Mandy Kwok, she actually started saying, well, you know, if the government is going to um, actually create all of this infrastructure improvement along the Jiao Priya River, can it, be, can it have multiple functions? Can we solve the issues of rice subsidies and the need for a better livelihood for farmers um, while at the same time upgrading our infrastructure? And so she came up with, um, oh, I guess I don't have that drawing in there. She came up with this development scheme. She basically said, why don't we bring in private investors to come create these um, new infrastructure, but then these infrastructures that are also warehouses for rice would actually have multiple types of functions. So she looked at things like uh, movie studios and um, uh, sort of a beauty spa resort area. And so she began to combine different types of programs and and um, laminated that with infrastructure in order to add value and to provide other types of funding. Now, you might think that this is problematic, um, the, the way that uh, investment is coming into this region. But you have to remember that in Southeast Asia, uh, the political climate is very, very fractious. Basically, um, with a co corrupt government, you can't trust the government. Um, and so it, it was very interesting for students from Hong Kong that had complete trust in government at that time um, to go into a co situation where corruption is everywhere um, and that um, the, the people um, disagreed with almost everything that the government did. And they believed that the only way to really make a difference is for p private money. Um, to come in. And so this is the background of where a lot of these strategies came from. So Mandy did you know, her due diligence. She actually looked at logistic flows of rice, where these warehouses could be, um, started looking at different programs and different landscape conditions, um, and designed a movie studio um, that specialized in flood scenes um, that was also, you know, so instead of flooding your warehouse in LA, you could flood the Chao Priya River, which floods anyway. Um, so, so those are the kind of projects that came out of this investigation um, and this sort of outrage against what was happening in that landscape. Um, so as part of this investigation, I, I just want to give you a little bit of background. We, the next year, we actually looked at the, the coast um, of the Jiao Priya River. And what's happened is that um, in the 60s, two large dams were built, one over here and one over here. Um, and in addition to that, a, a huge amount of irrigation canals were built um, throughout this region. And what happened is that the, the um, sediment that naturally flows down the river got choked. It got stuck in these large dams in the irrigation system. It's the same thing that happened to the Nile um, with Aswan Dam. And so what happened along the coast of Thailand was that um, because sediment was no longer coming out from the river, um, there was coastal erosion up to about 100 meters a year, which is pretty significant. That's been happening for the past 30, 40 years. And so there's these communities that used to be in the middle of the floodplain that are now actually in islands in the middle of the ocean, um, which is really, really weird. In addition to that, um, the coastal mangroves were um, destroyed during this process. And so here you actually see a nonprofit, a, a grassroots movement, um, a, a group of fish farmers that just wanted to restore the mangrove. And so they've been experimenting with different ways of restoring the mangroves along the shore. Now, I'm not going to dwell on the mangrove restoration, um, even though I had students that worked on that as well. I want to focus on what happens before the mangroves. It goes back to shrimp. Thailand is also the largest exporter of shrimp in the world. Uh, most of it comes to this country, actually. You should beware. Um, and the, the thing about uh, the Thai, uh, OK, maybe I'm Chinese, so there's something wrong with the Chinese, too. In the 1990s, Taiwanese investors came to Thailand and invested in shrimp ponds. Um, so they occupied the entire shore. Um, they introduced um, intensive shrimp farming techniques, which is you know, antibiotics, you know, um, chemicals, and very, very quick life cycles. Um, and in the late 1990s, there was a huge biological um, uh, crisis. Um, there was a virus that went around and killed all the shrimp. And so the, the Thai shrimp farmers had to, to re-strategize and actually introduce new types of shrimp into the landscape. Um, but because of that virus outbreak, uh, what happened along here was that a lot of the shrimp ponds actually became abandoned. Um, farmers no longer found it um, 
profitable. They couldn't actually have shrimp in there. And so they started excavating the ponds and used the fill for construction in Bangkok. Um, they abandoned it. Um, but because it was abandoned and because of the sort of levels, so that area actually become became even more vulnerable to erosion um, because it was no longer managed. So again, students looked into the various types of shrimp farming, um, started to map uh, pollution sources, um, and uh, we found a few threats. The first was that there was contamination coming from existing shrimp ponds, um, highly uh, high nutrient levels in the water, um, saline intrusion. Um, another thing is that because of the sort of the swing in the um, wet and dry cycles, um, saltwater intrusion into Bangkok was a huge, huge issue. So I'm going to talk about two student projects. The first student project starts to address issues of saline intrusion into the groundwater. And so she looked into the different technologies, and she adopted a very, very simple um, technology that's used everywhere in the world. She basically created these injection wells um, and created them along the last line of defense. And so you would actually inject fresh water into the ground in order to create sort of a barrier, um, and so salt water wouldn't um, continue to migrate inland. Um, the fresh water came from a series of water treatment um, strategies. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, but what I thought, and this is where the statement that I made earlier comes into play. I don't believe we can save the world. Um, there is no way in the long term that even with interventions like this, that we can hold off um, saline intrusion forever. This is not a sustainable solution. It is a technical one. It works for maybe 20 years. But what happens after that? All technical solutions at some point fall apart. Right? And so then what, what's next? So here, while she's using established technologies, um, established ways of dealing with saltwater intrusion, but there's this sort of fear that at some point the system is going to break down. And so what she did was she created a bike path. And she actually made these, um, these uh, uh, injection wells part of the tourist attraction. She's like, look, this is what we have to do in order to prevent salt water from migrating inwards, and that's to protect your freshwater source. This is what we have to do. It's a huge engineered structure. The second thing she did along this bike path was she planted, um, and I wish she did a rendering, but she didn't. She planted, she only talked about it. This is why you have to do renderings. Um, so she actually planted these strips of um, saltwater sensitive plants. Um, and, and plants that were very, um, so these plants, if they hit any kind of salt water, would actually die, right? And so that it's, not a, it's not supposed to be a band of death, but it's really um, a, a series of indicator species that tell us visually on the ground what is happening underground. Um, and so I thought that this was a really powerful project. Again, we can't save the world, but we can do something to make these processes visible in a fairly pragmatic way. Um, and I think that is really where some of these projects are very powerful. A second student looked into um, shrimp ponds, and I'm just going to give you another little fact. So since the coastal shrimp ponds are abandoned, a lot of the shrimp ponds moved inland. And what we found out was that um, the, because shrimp need, shrimps um, need a bit of salt water, and so farmers actually truck salt water from the coast inland um, in order to uh, keep the shrimp alive. What that means is that all of the, the intricate um, canals in the interior of the coast, um, inland of the coast, that used to be rice paddies, are now contaminated not only with high nutrients and chemicals from the shrimp farms, but also salt water. And so you can begin to imagine the impact of this sort of salt water on the local ecology. So again, the, the student. Um, made a very, very simple proposal. She said, what if we actually just separate the irrigation canals from the wastewater canals? Because before, they were all integrated. Now let's separate them out um, and create separate systems. And what if we direct the wastewater into certain areas and treat it, and et cetera, but then we actually create a new kind of ecosystem? You actually have inland. Uh, in a very small amount of space, the entire range of fresh water to salt water. And you can actually create 
different types of ecosystems within that large, that, that range of salt water. So she actually looked into the animals and the plants that would live in every kind of condition, and she decided to create a safari park um, inland. Um, that you know crossed a large region, um, but again, playing on the sort of local industries and trying to figure out if there are other ways to turn a, a, a nuisance and a waste um, into something that potentially could be profitable. You know, why why are safaris only in um, Africa? They can be in Thailand too. Um, and so this is sort of her vision of what could happen um, should these shrimp ponds turn into something else, um, and you actually begin to create create. Um, the, this amazing collection of aquatic species um, within this very small piece of land. Okay, I'm gonna just, I'm not gonna be able to go through everything that I prepared, so the last um, set of projects I wanna talk about, um, there, th um, there are works that, uh, that are quite pragmatic. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the rural landscape in China. This is a village. Um, it might not look like one because it's very tall, it's very dense, but this is classified as a village. It's in the Pearl River Delta. It's, in, uh, it's near Guangzhou. Um, and what happened was that um, the villagers saw factories coming into the Pearl River Delta and they decided to make a profit off of it. So they tore down their ancestral homes and built what we call handshake buildings um, illegally. Um, so they have very, very small floor plates. They're very, very high. They're very close together, so there's no natural sunlight whatsoever. Um, and the, the villagers actually move to other cities, um, and they rent this out to migrant workers that are working in the factories. So this became the sort of new mode of economic production in rural villages in the Pearl River Delta. And so this is one kind of village. And the reason they're able to do this is because villages as an administrative kind of um, uh, uh, unit in China has a special status. It is not governed by the central government. They actually have a high level of autonomy. So villagers get to vote and make decisions about what to do with their land. If they don't want a certain developer to come in, they can veto it. However, most of the time, they band together to see how they can actually make the greatest profit off of the land that they control. Now, this is a kind of a cynical view of that. There are other good examples, which I will show you later. But th these are the dynamics in um, current Chinese um, villages. And so what you see across China are situations like this. This isn't a village. Uh, there's constant construction, um, not just in the village, but outside of the village as well. This particular village decided to sell some of their farmland to create an IT park. These two villages decided to keep their sort of rural identity, but with improvements. So this village over here decided that they were going to be an art village. It's near Guangzhou too, actually. And so they, they had, I mean, they originally had a few artists, but then they decided to really capitalize on that. Um, and so now this village, I visited the village the first time in 2009. There was like one art studio. And now... There's so many art studios. There's art schools there where you know high school kids come to learn how to draw. And every other house has become a cafe. When I first went there in 2009, I had to bring my own coffee. I literally brought my own coffee press because it was, it was kind of problematic. Um, and so this is what's happening in villages um, in order to generate a new source of income because subsistence farming obviously doesn't work anymore. Um, and they haven't really converted into anything else. Rural, mi rural urban migration is a huge problem in China. And one of these projects um, be that begins to question that particular status is Mulan Elementary School. On the left is the new high-speed rail that is um, connecting Guangzhou to the western part of China. And so um, this, this high-speed rail um, from Shenzhen, it would take about an hour, less than an hour to get here. Um, the first time I went to this village, it took us seven hours from Guangzhou um, by car. Um, two years later, it took four hours, so we still had to stay overnight and then drive the first thing out. Now, by car, it's two hours because they have, or two and a half hours because they have a new tunnel. So infrastructure investment in China is making these rural villages more and more accessible. And so what we're seeing is that while in the past there was this huge uh, rural urban migration, people flock to the cities. Now we're seeing 
the, the influx of migrants back to their original villages. This idea that they no longer have to go very far and still participate in the world market. So, um, so there are questions about it. I'm going to go through very quickly what this project is. This is a school. This is an elementary school. The original school is over here. Um, I was working with um, a Rural Urban Framework, also based out of Hong Kong U. Um, they built a school over here. Um, and they had a donor that wanted to be, build a toilet. And I was like, OK, what does it have to do with me? Um, they wanted a toilet that was also, um, uh, that was also a playground. Um, and so one of the issues that I had to deal with as a designer was really starting to think about how you would actually create um, this landscape um, in relationship to everything. So this is the old school, this is the new school, um, and the toilet is over here. Um, we used topography as a way to mitigate some of the very steep slopes over here that had um, erosion problems. Um, and, and as architects and designers, you might be interested in this, but this is uh, the cross-section of um, the toilet into a series of uh, wetlands. And so uh, what the architects try to do, um, you can tell from the section, is that they wanted to collect water from the landscape around it. So that we graded the mound so that water would actually go into a tank at the back of the, um, the building. And then it's also, um, there, there's also uh, a gap between the, the roof and the interior to allow for better um, air circulation. Um, and so the water's all gravity fed. Um, we, uh, the water tank is sufficient so we can provide at least 60% of the fresh water needed for the toilet. Um, and then all of that wastewater goes into a septic tank and then is treated through a wetland. And so the idea was to really educate students in this village um, about wetlands, um, the, the role that wetlands play in our community, um, and et cetera. So um, it's about, com it's almost complete. Um, what's really funny, and this is my first project in China, so I'll share a little bit of experiences with you. Um, so the project title is the Mulan Elementary School Wetland and uh, Playground. The, arch the con contractor, in his bid, decided to eliminate all of the planting for the wetland, um, even though that was the main reason why this project was built. So I still don't have plants in the wetland, even though it's supposed to be a wetland. Um, another thing is that um, we had a very, very difficult time getting the contractor to understand the wetland. And, and this is something that, as designers, you're going to confront all the time, is when we introduce new technologies or new ways of doing things, it's not the users that you need to convince. It's really the people that build your projects that you need to work with. So I had a huge, I, I think I had like a two-month confrontation with a contractor about putting um, a very, very simple wetland liner um, for the wetland. So for those of you that know anything about this technology, you need to contain the water so that the soil actually treats the water and you don't want it to infiltrate into the ground. That's really important for treatment wetlands. Um, and he just refused to buy um, a liner. Um, and so I actually had to go to Guangzhou and I had to source a liner. I had to buy it, literally. I bought the liner and then I shipped it to him so that he could use it. And so these are the kinds of battles that you confront when you're working in areas that have never seen this kind of technology. Um, my worry, though, is that in five years when they need to replace that liner, then no one's going to buy that liner. So then, uh, so these kinds of experiments become very, very difficult. However, what is really funny about this contractor is um, he wanted to customize all the pavers. I just wanted you know, a standard paver for everything. And he's like, no, 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 we'll custom cast it for you. So there's a contradiction, again, in terms of what kinds of crafts that they are willing to go to versus the technology that they don't understand. So again, the role of the designer is also interesting in terms of how we actually communicate um, with uh, the contractor and the people that build and maintain um, the systems that we design. So we had to, in a very short amount of time, he's like, I need the design tomorrow. In a, in, in a week, we had to design a, a paver system that actually would create gradations of porous pavement. Um, so something from 100% paved to something that was about 30% um, uh, porous. Um, and 
also figure out a way to communicate to him how to construct it. Now, I didn't want the, the contrast between the two different pavers, and I didn't want that kind of configuration either, but the contractor got really happy in terms of uh, making the different colors, and so as long as he's happy, I'm happy. Um, these are the types of things that I'm learning about constructing in rural landscapes all over China. Um, the last project I'm going to talk about is um, a village reconstruction project. In 2008, um, in Sichuan, in 2008, you probably all remember this, um, there was a huge earthquake in Sichuan province. Um, lots of lives were, were lost. Uh, I'm not going to go into details because I don't remember the statistics. But um, after the earthquake, um, it, was, it was really interesting. The Chinese government decided they didn't want any outside help. They went and did all of their emergency management. They reconstructed villages. And within a couple of years, everything was reconstructed. Um, so this particular village, Jingtai village, um, had the government support. They reconstructed um, in 2009. And then in 2011, there was a landslide. Um, on the same site because they didn't build adequate foundations. They also didn't realize that this was a geotechnically unstable area after the earthquake. And so the village, 25 homes, got wiped out completely again for the second time. And so this is um, where we came in. We were approached by Habitat for Humanity to provide technical assistance to this village. Um, this isn't the village that we're looking at. This is a typical village in the same region that was reconstructed after the earthquake. So you can see tiled homes, very generic structures, um, uh, very large um, floor plans, um, and uh, kind of not very functional kind of spaces um, architecturally. And so we convinced the villagers actually that they didn't need a large house. That what they should actually do is to create the right proportion of spaces within the houses um, so that we could actually create a denser village um, within the constraints of the site. Um, and so uh, another thing about the site is that there's about 30 feet of topography change within a, a very small amount of area. So what we did was we decided to use the house itself as a retaining structure. So down here you have steps up front um, that takes care of about uh, two and a half feet of grade change. And then in the back, and you can't see this in this drawing, um, we actually are able to um, fill up to two and a half feet in the back of the house. And that way, we could uh, deal with five feet of grade change um, per house. Um, this is what it, the, again, I'm not an architect, so I'm not going to go into details, but you can tell there's a lot of thought going into the entire house. Um, one important feature that we had recommended was for them to use a particular kind of brick. It's a clay-centered hollow brick that has better insulation than the conventional brick. It was more expensive, um, but it also came in a lot of different colors. And so what we convinced them to do was to use this brick and create these patterns so that they didn't have to go back and use these sort of ceramic tiles and tile the entire facade of the house. Um, that the, the material itself and its uh, use and distribution along uh, across the community would create enough ornament that would satisfy um, the villagers themselves. Another thing we did, um, because we had the chance to you know, rebuild a complete community, um, was to incorporate uh, a, a, a water cycles within the design process. And so water is collected on the roof. It's stored. Um, we have rainwater reuse. Um, gray water recycling systems, all the sewage goes into a wetland. Um, we have biogas facilities um, for cooking and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it all seemed like a wonderful kind of um, ecological system. However, what was really complicated was how this project was funded. The villagers, while they were paying for their own houses, couldn't afford all the sustainable features that we had recommended. Um, in fact, the, the clay-centered hollow brick was so expensive that um, the house pr the cost of the house went up about 30%, which is pretty significant um, for a, a, a house like that. And that doesn't include all the other sustainable features that we had um, recommended. Um, so we had to bring a, in an outside donor that only funded those particular features. Um, at the same time, the local government was in, uh, investing in um, the infrastructure. And so funding and the sources of this money and who was going to manage it after it was constructed and the role of the designer when we actually were not the architects on record became a very, very complicated affair. 
But anyway, going back to the landscape. So our original idea was that we would create these subtle terraces to deal and negotiate that 30 foot drop in elevation through these small terraces um, that went throughout the site rather than two large retaining walls. Um, we then had to modify that because we ran out of money. Um, and how many of you are architects? All right. So I'm just going to make one really bad comment about architects. The architects spend the entire budget, and I was left with nothing, literally. Um, and it was stupid railings that he wanted. Um, and so he created these, uh, these buildings. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail. Um, and on the roof, um, OK. On the roof, those are the railings that spent, up, uh, spent my budget. Um, on the roof, you can see from this picture, you actually create these terraces um, that the villagers wanted to use to, um, for planting vegetable gardens. Now, what's interesting about the community process was that the, the community knew about these terraces for a very long time, for about two years. And then once they saw it built, they were like, oh, don't fill that up and make them into you know, terraces that you can sit on. We don't need that for drying. That's perfect for vegetable gardens. Let's do a green roof. And so they actually took initiative and said, you know, this is what we want, rather than us imposing our ideas on it. They actually hated our idea. Um, and so we're like, okay, cool. Um, let's make them vegetable beds. Um, and what, so then the, the, that, that was a very interesting thing. Now, remember I talked about how we were going to use the house as a retaining structure and actually bury the back of the house? Well, the villagers knew about that for about two years. Um, and then when the buildings were actually built, I got a call one day from the contractor. And they were like, um, it's bad feng shui to have your bed below grade. So you, your, the, the he, your head, when you sleep, cannot be below ground. It's really, really bad luck. And I'm like, but you've known about this for two years. And now you tell me? Yeah. He's like, yeah, and I need the grading plan tomorrow because uh, we're going to start constructing the landscape tomorrow. So again, this is why it's interesting working with communities because, I mean, we communicate. You saw we built models. We had drawings. We had extensive sessions with the community. But they still didn't understand spatially what was really happening on the ground, despite all these wonderful features. And so again, we scrambled. Um, they cut my, they, remember I said that they spent all my money, so I have no more money left. Um, I had to remove all of these wonderful plazas between the houses in order that we thought would be great community spaces. Um, and we had to, so this is sort of the bare minimum amount of paving on the ground. Um, and so it, it's a really interesting process to work through this, um, especially uh, in, in an environment that's constantly changing. Um, and I actually think the design is better for it. So now what the village is going to have are these sort of plinths that surround the house, that are their productive spaces and community spaces that are interconnected with these ramps. Um, all of them are accessible, so you could, well, they don't have wheelchairs, but you could you know, drive your little motorcycle up and park it next to your house, you can, you can see here. Um, but then in the middle, what they're going to do, and again, my planting budget got cut. It seems to be a, the story of my life. Um, the, the, in between, we've already spoken to the villagers, and we actually went on a couple trips with the villagers to identify plants that are indigenous to their area, and for them to be able to actually harvest some of these plants and plant them in their own space. Right? So rather than going to a nursery and you know, trying to, to get all these plants like a normal landscape architect was, I had to go into the hills. Um, and steel plants. So this is the, the kind of process that we're working. You can see um, this is right before Chinese New Year, about a month and a half ago. Um, and we are currently, um, the families are starting to move in. Um, as you can see, they, they've appropriated it. Um, they, they hated the sky, uh, the sky well, uh, the light well. And so they're all like covering it all up. Um, so yeah, all the good intentions that we had. Um, and this is a, a, okay. This is the the view from um, one of the houses. So I guess the lesson here is that um, sustainability takes the form it takes many different forms, and it's really in the eye of the beholder. Um, it, it really depends on its context, um, it, the economics and politics of how these things come together are very very important and. Uh, shape the projects in ways that you would never imagine. Um, and practicing in this region has been very challenging because the, the drawings, you know, all those drawings that you work on, actually, um, they, they don't really mean anything. 
Um, and what I'm confronted with on a daily basis is how my ideas are effectively communicated to local communities, um, especially since my Chinese is really bad. Um, and second, they don't read drawings or models. They don't understand any of the communication devices that we learn in school. And so that becomes probably the greatest challenge when you actually want to build responsibly um, in, in this context. So that's all I have for today, and thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, we can talk. Uh, unfortunately, because of time shortages, we have to move on to the next event, which is the panel upstanding at Katisma. Um, so uh, we will have a gathering later where you can ask more of your questions if you have any. Um, we have about a five minute break before the Katisma event starts. So if you want to make your way up to 279, uh, that'd be lovely. Thank you so much, and thank you again for your